Hey guys, we have a new sponsor for the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. The company's called Liberté Lifestyle. So Liberté is a French word meaning freedom, and the company was founded on the desire to have freedom to choose what we want to do with our lives. I actually had the owner, um, Nicole, on my podcast on episode 28, so if you want to go back and listen to her, um, she talks about how she started the company and what she wants to do in the future with the company, which is pretty cool. So uh, they actually have knee sleeves, wrist wraps, shirts, shorts. Uh, love the knee sleeves. I have the ice cream knee sleeves, and I love them so much. They haven't, the neoprene's still good. Uh, the seams haven't split compared to other uh, knee sleeves that I have had in the past, uh, and I'm planning to keep these for a very, very long time. So uh, Nicole actually gave me a promo code for you guys too. So it's all capital letters, T-Y-P-E, and the number one. So it's type one. So go to LibertéLifestyle.com, uh, check out what they have in the store, use the promo code type one, and save some coin. Now let's go to the episode. Hey guys, before we start this episode, I wanted to talk to you about Type 1 Lifting. So Type 1 Lifting is a clothing line that proceeds of the shirts and tanks and everything else goes to the Children's Diabetes Foundation. So um, this all came about with me and seeing a five-year-old girl in the emergency department uh, that had a new onset of diabetes. So uh, just take a look at the website. It's www type1lifting.com so just check it out if you don't buy anything that's perfectly fine uh, I would just like for you just to take a look and just see what we have so like I said before www.type1lifting.com and guys I hope you enjoy the show All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. I have a personal trainer, Orange Theory coach, and fellow diabetic, Eliza Tesler. How's everything going today? Hey, everything's good. How are you doing? No, no complaints. You know, just ate some lunch, and now I'm ready to do a podcast with you. So um, typically with my all the diabetics I interview, I always ask them, you know, when did they first get diagnosed with diabetes? Um, so I got diagnosed in 2006. I was 12 years old. Um, I got hit in the face by a door at, at school and I started crying and I'm like, oh my God, like, this is so embarrassing. I have to go home. So I like went to the nurse's office and the nurse was like, what's wrong? And I'm like crying. I'm like, my head hurts. I'm not going to tell her I got hit in the face by a door. Cause that's embarrassing. Um, so my uncle came to pick me up from school and he's like, he looks at me and he calls my mom. He's like, she doesn't look too good. And I'm like, oh, well. Thank you. I just got, you know, like I felt okay, mostly, um, other than being embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And my mom's like, okay, take her to the doctor. So we go to the doctor and my mom gets there and they're talking. And, you know, at that point I'm already, I'm, I bounced back. I'm good. But my mom goes, oh, she, she lost a lot of weight. She's been drinking a lot of water. She's been peeing a lot. Um, I hope it's not what I'm afraid of. And the doctor did a year analysis and he's like, oh, well, there's ketones. Better get her to the ER. And my mom was crying hysterically, by the way. Like she like she thought it was the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think I cried for about three seconds. Then I'm like, all right, what's next? What do I do? Yeah. Um, and it was around like Hanukkah time. So I was really worried about not being able to eat donuts. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, I could see that. So um, has your mom, obviously like, you know, that's a real big issue that like, you know, you get diabetes and your parents are like, all right, what's going to happen next? So how do they kind of like calm down a little bit and like make it a little bit easier for you, especially at being 12, it's a little difficult. Um, so my dad's actually a doctor. Okay. He, he wasn't too worried. Um, my mom though, she's like, she was very concerned and you know, I'm her little baby and she was, she had months of crying and being nervous. And I think that like, I think I was actually the calming force in the house where I was just like, it's fine. Like I, my mom never gave me, no one ever gave me an injection other than like myself and maybe a doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of just, my mom keeps telling me about how I got diagnosed on a Friday, Saturday night I went bowling. So, <laughs> so I, it was a very quick adjustment period for me. I, I, I'm not afraid of needles. I was just like, all right, I'll do what I have to do. Yep. That was that. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised they, they didn't actually keep you in the ICU for a couple of days. You know something, looking back, I'm kind of surprised too. 
but my blood sugar I think was in the like 360s okay yeah I got in and I don't know I guess I just seemed okay yeah I was very skinny I was like I was a very active kid so they weren't worried though it made a lot more sense to my mom that I was like ditching school she thought I was like baking sick really I like did not feel so great Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the weekends I felt fine though because I was able to like run around yeah and actually like just like kind of sleep in a little bit and all that stuff and you know yeah yeah so the the lots of water thing was very concerning to my parents like I was like a camel but after like a very long journey in the desert yeah that was pretty much me in the middle of the night like I would get up to the bathroom like five times and I would just slam OJ right before I go back to bed because I was just like so thirsty and typically for me if I drink OJ or Gatorade or something like that it makes my you know makes it a a little bit better and so I was just like going to town on it and it was you know it was crazy just to think like I've been in the medical field for like 14 years and then like not really noticing the symptoms myself. It's just like, God, like I'm such an idiot. Like, why didn't I think about this? You know something? I think it's hard to see when you're so close to it. Like my dad's one of the best doctors, like probably ever. And he, you know, he was like, oh, she's growing. It's okay. A lot of water. She's growing, peeing a lot. She's, she's just getting older, losing weight. Okay. She's hitting puberty, whatever. Yeah. And so with like, speaking about puberty, so when you hit puberty, was there like crazy sugar levels like throughout like the whole time of through puberty for you? You know something? I don't really remember. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I think I was mostly okay. Um, I was on an insulin pump at that point. I think I had 10 days of multiple daily injections. Then my doctor's like, get on the pump. And I'm like, okay. Well, actually it wasn't that easy. I, I was pretty adamant about not going in the pump i was scared about the tubes i'm like where does it go yeah yeah no i hear and they didn't really let me in on it until they actually gave me it and i'm like oh this is not where i thought it went (laughs) this is not this isn't what i thought was happening um so yeah it was i think my sugars were okay through puberty it was when i was like in my rebellious teenage years Mm -hmm. really kind of started going like you know i'd go out late and my pump would like the site would need a change and I'd be like, I'm tired. I'll do it tomorrow. I'd mm-hmm. wake up with like a 500 blood sugar. I'd be like, such is life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've, you know, I, I've seen kids when I was working in the ER, like just like that, they were just rebellious. Like don't take their insulin. They're like, I don't want to be a diabetic anymore. You know, I'm not taking insulin. This is not worth it. You know, just whatever. Take, take the punches. No, well, I wasn't rebelling against the diabetes necessarily. Yeah. It was more that like my parents were saying, okay, come home early. And I was like, no, I'm going out until 7 a.m. And then my pump would run out of insulin or something. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like, a, I'm not diabetic anymore. It was more like, a, well, it's inconvenient for me to do that right now. I'll do it later. So my blood sugars weren't like consistently 500. Yeah. But I definitely have those peaks yep. where <laughs> I didn't feel great. And, and you know how high blood sugar feels, especially if it's held for a while. Like it does not feel good. Mm-hmm. Can I, it's like the worst yeah well can i tell you something like when i get high i, I high blood sugar i can't tell whatsoever like i don't really? get i don't get headaches i don't i like granted i could drink a lot of water in general but like i go to the bathroom and think it's normal like i just can't tell whatsoever for me it'll depend it depends how high and it depends for how long like i'll have times where you know it's in like let's say the low 200s and i won't really notice it but as soon as it gets past like 250 like I start getting groggy and like my speech gets slurred and I'm just like, like I feel grumpy, like very, very grumpy. Hmm. And like, you know, my parents know to ask me like if I'm being worse than usual, <laughs> they'll be like, they'll be like, is your blood sugar high? And I'm like, I don't even know. I don't want to test it. Yeah. Um, but honestly, that was back in the finger stick days. Now that I've moved on to like the Libra. Yeah. And and I'm not trying to plug them. I'm not sponsored by them, though they are a very nice company. I would love to be sponsored by them. Um, um, listen to me, Abbott. <laughs> um, at Abbott. I am a lot less reluctant to test my blood sugar. That's where I was going with that. Yeah. So now, like, it's easier to catch the highs and understand where they're going. Mm-hmm. So that was a very long. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's all it's all good. So have you tried the Dexcom or have you tried both of them? So I think. I tried a CGM back when I was probably like maybe 13 or 14, like very, very young. Mm -hmm. And back then it wasn't very accurate. So I remember like the nurse practitioner explaining to me, she's like, Oh, it's not like super precise. You can't really make any decisions on it, but it'll give you like ballpark ranges. And I'm a very precise person. So like, I'm like, okay, I'm either 
getting a precise reading from this or I'm getting precise reading from a finger stick. If I'm not getting it from that, I'm sticking with the finger sticks. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, it might have been the Medtronic CGM okay. that I tried. Um, so I might not have ever tried the Dexcom. And I also don't think my insurance covers the Dexcom. Ah, okay. Yeah, because they... they uh... I, I've been on the Dexcom for like a little while, like before the new year, after like before the new year. And so I, the one thing that would piss me off is because it would like every 15 minutes, if you're high and you already took your insulin, it would still vibrate like the whole time. It'd be like every 15 minutes. And it's just like, and yet, and it's on your phone. So there was like one time I was in a, on an interview for a new job and and like my phone was vibrating like every 15 minutes that I was in the interview. And so I'm like trying not to, you know, get distracted with my phone and actually talk to the people about the position. And it, it was, yeah, that's, and even at night too, like granted, like, you know, you're not supposed to have high blood sugar at night, but it would vibrate every single time. And like, it'd be like midnight and it's still vibrating. I'm like, I just took insulin. Damn it. Like what's going on? You know, it's, that's the one thing that just pisses and you me can't, off. Like, you can't stop the alarm. You, you can, but I, I really don't want to, but there's like a couple of times where right. I actually was just like, screw it. Just shut the alarm off and just deal with it later. So, and then like I woke up the next morning, my blood sugar was normal. Um, I could see that being very useful if you have like hypo or hyperglycemia unawareness. Yeah. Um, like for the Libra, that's kind of the one things I don't really like about it. I'd rather have like an alarm for when I'm high, when I'm low, I feel it like, oh, yeah. there's no getting around that. Yeah. But when I'm high, like I, I don't know until a certain point. So mm -hmm. it would be helpful to have an alarm. Yeah. Um, however, I can see it being annoying to yeah. have it vibrating during a job interview. Yeah. And then another thing so, with, and then another thing with the, with the Libra I've had, I used that for like, I think a month. Someone gave it to me just to test it out. And like, I put it in the back of my arm where it's supposed to be, but I like, I sweat so bad when I work out. It's like I just put like KT tape over it just to kind of keep it st sticking because it's, you know. Really? Oh, yeah, all so the time. for me, like, I thought that would be a problem. And I was thinking about it last night because I put a new one in last night. And I'm like, it's really strange that these last for two weeks because, like, you know, I'm a sweaty person. Like, I start breathing. I start sweating. Yeah. And it's it hasn't come off early or anything. Like, I haven't had any issues with it. And yeah. this is like my third one of it so like i just finished a month okay yeah because i so i think it could be just because i have hair in the back of my arms too I don't, I don't know that could be it yeah you know you should you should retry it yeah just I'm, give a little bzz, bzz. well yeah my new insurance like my, i'm the uh, one month of a libre is like 64 dollars for me and i'm like oh this is amazing like i originally it was like close to like three to four hundred dollars how much is the Dexcom? Um, I haven't t I haven't asked them yet because I just started this new job like a month ago. So and I'm under United Health Healthcare and even like I was like crapping my pants because I needed lo uh, long lasting insulin and the typically my old insurance would be like thirteen hundred dollars for it and so I was like I can't I can't do this so I went up to him and said Hey how much? Thirteen hundred for how long? A month? For like three months three. or actually yeah for a box so. Yeah, and so oh my the, God. and so this new one I got this new one for United Health um, Healthcare, I put it in and it was like thirty five dollars for just one box of the long lasting insulin, but it was like a different di different medication. But I'm like, oh my God, like I'm so lucky because I under I've seen people like crying because they can't afford insulin for their kids or themselves, and they're like, that's so crazy. I know, yeah that that's like a whole nother like I need to get on a soapbox for that one because it's like. It's sad just to see all these people, you know, can't afford insulin and they're telling their kids, listen, like you have to go on a no carb diet or something just to kind of make sure their blood sugar levels are normal. That's so, there has to be like a better system. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't even know where to like, if you could link places to go to like make changes like that, please link them and I'll. I'll share them with everyone. Yeah, well, well, I've actually heard a story of people going down to Tijuana, Mexico, and buying the insulin there, like a year supply of insulin for like eight hundred dollars or something like that. I've heard that, like with Canada. Yeah, that too. People, like order from Canada. Yep. Yeah, it's That's crazy. I like read it on Instagram comments. I'm like, huh. Yeah. It even occurred to me. Yeah, I've actually had a, fr uh, a friend of mine that works at the hospital that she still works there. She's like. Hey, if you ever need insulin, I'm going to go to Mexico within a month. So just let me know. And I was like, wow. okay. And so. you don't need a prescription for it? No, it's like a local like drugstore and there's no prescriptions needed for it. 
Damn. Yeah, it's insane. Like, like this, there was a group of like eight people. I, I was it eight people, something like eight people that all went down to one drunk store and they all paid like about. I think it was like all together they paid like eight thousand dollars for everything, and it would equal out to like forty three thousand dollars in U S. Wow. And they were saying that like, and the people in the U S. were saying like, oh, those drugs aren't regulated, but yet they're in the same colored pens, same pens, same style. Like it's. How is that not it's regulated? Like they're not regulated. It's the same insulin. Yeah, exactly. So. I guess maybe it's not regulated. I don't know, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's the same insulin. Yeah, you're getting it from the same company. Yep, yeah, pretty or similar companies. Pretty much, they just don't want people going down there and you know saving a boatload of money. Look, I'm looking for a reason to vacation as often as I could. <laughs> so as soon as I'm booted from my mom's insurance, it's off to Mexico with me. Yeah, no, I I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I'm 41, so I have to get my own insurance with like the, my whole family. So, I mean, if if when I, I turned 26, we were like freaking out. We we're just like, what yeah, do we do. Yeah. So, like, how long are you still on your uh, your parents' insurance? Um. So I actually got booted as soon as I turned 26. Okay. But there's something called Cobra, which basically extends whatever insurance you have for, I think it's three years. Yep. So I have three years until I need to worry about it again, though we are looking for cheaper alternatives because right now it's about 801. And that is a stab. Yeah. Um, a stab with a dagger, not with like an insulin needle. Yeah. <laughs> it's not great. No, I hear you. No, I hear you. So obviously you're, you're, you're a personal trainer at Orange Theory Fitness. Do you do like online coaching as well? Um... So I'm actually, my main focus right now is more on school. So I okay. love Orange Theory and I've been doing group fitness classes and coaching there for, I think, almost two years now. Um, so I'm sticking with that. I'm not really doing too much personal training or even online coaching just because school is so time consuming that mm -hmm. like my schedule has to be like down to a T to make sure that everything all fits in. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to school for? Uh, I don't want to say too much about it just because I don't like saying things until I actually like do Under them. Understandable. Um, I will say I'm an undergraduate taking prerequisites and they're a bunch of science courses. Okay. So you can draw whatever conclusions you want from that. I just don't want to, I don't want to jinx it, I guess. I don't Hey, don't die. I understand. I won't, we won't go any further with that. So, <laughs> so, I'm um, studying for a big test. Yes. That's all I could say. Okay. I'll, 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 I like it. I like it. So how did you get involved into like, you know, exercising and being like a personal trainer? That's a really good question. Um, I get asked that a lot. You'd think I'd have a better answer for it. Um, I was a magician's assistant for like a really big portion of my life. That's like really cool. To like 22. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really fun. I had a great time. Um, and then I had to quit the show. And I was like, huh, what should I do next? And I was always like active. I always liked like moving. I always like to feel strong. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, personal training. And it looks really glamorous from the outside. If we're being real, like, everyone's like, oh my God, you work with celebrities and you work out all day. It was not glamorous. No. <laughs> Especially my first personal training job. I got in and I knew, like, absolutely nothing. Um, I'm not sure to this day why they hired me. I came in, they asked me, like, if I had any certifications or any, like, background in exercise. And I was like, nope. And they're like, hired. <laughs> um, so I guess they just thought I could sell training packages. I left that job after about six months mm -hmm. and I also just wasn't that serious about training at that point. Like for that time period, I maybe worked out three times. Mm -hmm. um, then I started working at a different gym where I kind of got more into like, I guess, bodybuilding style training. And that was more interesting to me just because I was actually working with weights and like learning the movements and learning the biomechanics behind everything. And I held that job for like almost two years. And then I, ended up in Orange Theory because someone else from my job wanted to leave it, the one before. And he asked me to like come audition with him and he didn't make it, but I ended up making it as a coach. I mean, he made it in life. He, he just didn't make the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Under understandable, yeah. <laughs> I just made it sound like he was like, like <laughs> He's fine. Um, so yeah, I, it just became very addictive to see people's lives change through it i really like like taking people away from their reality mm -hmm. and before it was with the magic show and now it's with training them and for my own like for me i just like to be strong like i want to get like strong as fuck i don't care about getting big getting skinny whatever happens i just want to like outlift the guy next to me same here same here so how did you how did you like obviously starting orange theory it's like a group class so 
Um, actually, I've never been to an Orange Theory. I, can't, I have to be honest with you. So you should. You I, should get on that. It's fun. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. So, um, but uh, so I know it's a bit large group class. So, what was it like with your first time doing a group class? It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was horrified. Um, I was in a magic show for a really long time, but mm -hmm. during that show, I like I hardly ever spoke. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of like I got in the box, I got cut in half, I did all the stuff like that made the magic work whenever I wasn't on the stage. Um, so I was used to like being in front of a group. I wasn't used to speaking. Um, but as you start taking more classes, you get more used to like what works and what doesn't work. Um, during my audition, I was like singing along to the music into the microphone and I do not have a great singing voice. <laughs> I, remember, I remember like after the audition, they're like, okay, you did great. Just, just maybe don't sing into the microphone. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> now I mute the mic before I start singing. All good. All good. So, um, how do you, like, how did you get better? Like tour, like to now so like what did you did you like ask other people about like hey how do you do your style or do you watch like other group trainers and like other facilities like how did you learn to from like where you were terrified to now um practice it's really all about practice just like literally anything else mm -hmm. um i took a lot of classes and i look if i liked the coach i would kind of take notes on what i want to incorporate into my classes and if I didn't like the class, I would kind of incorporate what I don't want my classes to be like. And I'd make like mental notes of, okay, don't do that during class. That's not good. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually you just kind of bring it all together. Also, Orange Theory is really great with education for their coaches. And um, they require like good certifications, which is nice. And they also just, they want you learning. And even over like COVID when we were shut down, they were very like adamant that we did assignments and just kind of progressed in our just coaching abilities. Mm -hmm. And also I'm, I'm a cert certification kind of chaser. I really like to like learn more. Yeah. No, I, I'm the same way too. Like I love learning like podcasting, reading books. I mean, obviously I see the glute lab behind your, uh, on your bookshelf right now. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of Brett Contrero stuff back there. He's a, he's um, unbelievable, like unreal. The stuff he, that he, yeah. he posts the post, but, um, so, so pretty much like with the orange series stuff, like you have a microphone. So do you do the own, do you do the program yourself or is it already custom, you know, does someone else make it in, in the gym? Like how does that, how does that work? Um, so basically across all the orange theories, you, we all get the same template okay. or templates for the month and it tells us how to coach them and different cues and what the focus, like what exercise we're focusing on for that day. And um, it's really cool actually. So at first I was kind of like, ambivalent about not being able to do my own programming i'm like oh i want to be creative and i want to like progress people however i see fit to progress them um but on the flip side of that it's really nice to kind of get a program and learn like the methodology behind the programming and mm -hmm. why they're choosing what they're choosing for that day and what it's meant to do so i'm not just stuck in my own like box of thinking and it's the same reason like i like all these books and stuff i like to see how other people think and program and Orange Theory is really good for that. Yeah, and the good thing, um, and the good thing with Orange Theory is you could scale. Like if if you have clients that are can't do some of the workouts, you could scale it and be like, hey, you know, do this instead of this. Yeah, absolutely. Everything is scalable, um, and the coaches are all meant to know different options for the members who like can't do something. Um, you know a lot about Orange Theory for someone who's never been there. I'm like, I'm, I'm think <laughs> I'm thinking I'm, I'm pretty much thinking it's like. So I've been to some some things like that kind of. So because like I used to do group classes myself at a gym up in Massachusetts, and like I would scale pretty much everything if like some people can't do it. So I mean I, I've I'm I'm old, so I have a lot of like decent experience like for training and stuff and scaling with people. That's good. Yeah. It's honestly really good to have that because you always have clients who're like I can't do this, and then. You I mean, you really think on the spot. Yeah. Just like, okay, like you could do this and it's going to be close enough and get like the same muscle groups. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also something that takes practice because, you know, Orange Theory has three different things going on at once and you control three different groups of people. Yeah. And you need to really think like, like that. Mm-hmm.
um it's fun it's a challenge but it's an exciting challenge you should take an orange theory class i know there's this one down the well the thing is like i i'm an early morning don't say it's down the street i'm gonna be upset if that no no it's like it's like two exits down the road for me so it's like probably like 15 20 minutes but i i wake up at five o'clock in the morning to go to the i wake up at 4 30 actually to go to the gym at five and so I, I'm more, of, I'm more of a CrossFit style guy, like you know, lifting heavy, like Olympic lifting, you know, wall balls, handstand pushups, and stuff like that. So I mean, I, I'm all, I'm down for trying anything. So that's not quite Orange Theory. Orange no. Theory is a little bit more reserved than that. Yes, but it's worth a shot. Yeah, it's just, it's a different experience than CrossFit. I used to work at a CrossFit gym also, and you know, I love them and I love everything that they do very different than orange theory oh yeah in my opinion yeah no i agree because they don't have the barbells i mean they have kettlebells dumbbells or they have a rower so yeah like orange theory doesn't even have kettlebells we're like oh they don't okay (laughs) you're like what no no no, i'm not knocking it (laughs) um we have dumbbells treadmills and rowers okay yeah but it's like it's more like it's more like the disney of working out this is more like for general health and people who like they want to learn and they want a great workout and they have an hour of their day to do it and we're going to get help them get that. CrossFit is is a little well Orange Theory is pretty culty, but CrossFit is that's a different kind of cult. Yeah. I mean, I mean you you'll definitely have like your kettlebell like only kettlebell work like extra fitness people cults and like there's there's cults every even like the Globo Gym cults. Like, you know, you have all the dudes what? that like the Globo Gym I, I call it like a like a commercial gym, like you know, um, like Gold's Planet Gym, Fitness. yeah, Planet Fitness, Gold's Gym. You have like the like the little cult there of the dudes that like, you know, you have your stereotypical guy that likes to lift heavy and like talk to everyone in the world, and then you have like the other people that just like do awful form on squats and curls and all that stuff. So I mean, and they just stick with it and they don't really yes. change anything. Yes, yeah. Have you have you had like any people like that at Orange Theory, and like how did you talk to them about it? Um, so most people, are, like, again, everything gets better with practice. So mm-hmm. I've had people come to my class and like day one, they might have like what some would describe as awful form, but you know, you keep giving them cues and correcting it little by little. And eventually they get, they get better at it, like a lot better, especially once they, once you hit them in a way that they understand, they'll fix it. Mm-hmm. You know, like different cues work for different people. Some people really need to see you do it over and over for them to do it correctly. And some people just need to hear it over and over for them to do it correctly. But eventually they do progress. Then there are some people who like, I had a woman yell at me the other day for correcting her. Um, she like, we were doing a medicine ball exercise. She literally threw the ball to the ground and she's like, I can't fucking do this. And I'm like, you can believe the F word. No, no, it's okay. Saying. It's okay. I put the, e- I put the explicit uh, button on, on the, on the podcast. So you're good. Okay, good. Just for that one F bomb. Um, <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, okay. Didn't correct her ever since then. Yeah. Like if I see her doing something dangerous, I'll come over. But some people just, the only way to progress is to kind of change what, like the way you're approaching something. Mm-hmm. So if you're not picking up heavier weights ever, if you're not trying to like perfect your form ever, you're not going to see the results you want to do and, or want to see. And if you are listening and you are like, trying to get better you will get better mm-hmm. i to- totally agree i mean watching videos you know just certain cues you know that i use for for people and you know and just even like other people like looking at other people i think that's huge just to learn i mean most of most of my olympic lifting learning is from youtube so that's amazing you know i've been trying to get more into olympic lifting and i'm like afraid to do it without a coach or someone there watching me but you saying you learned most of it from YouTube is giving me hope. Yeah, I mean it's, I mean I, I originally like I I was at a CrossFit gym for a little while before I start before like you know I went on my own. But I you know when I was on my own, I'd watch YouTube videos. I rec- I record myself and just like you know slowly, after a while I started to progress to like you know lifting the most I've ever lifted ever, at four at forty at forty one. So yeah, it's 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 been a long journey. So I mean. I remember just, you know, clean and jerk in like 135 in the, you know, I thought that was like a whole, you know, a challenge. And now I'm like almost. It is a challenge. Yeah. When you first do it, of course it is. And then like tripling it to like almost like 320 right now. Actually, 320 is my, my, my personal best. That's wild. Yeah. And it's so great. Like it's such a like majestic sport. Yeah. It's yeah. It's so graceful. Yeah. And, and it, I'm not like my body type is not the best for Olympic weightlifting because I'm 6'6". 
Oh my god. So. Yeah, no. No, not at all. Your body's working against you. Yeah, pretty much. But I, I love doing it though. It's just fun. Even like doing like CrossFit, like you know, like all the gymnastic movements and stuff. You know, there it's it's mainly for tall, mainly for like real short people, except for like rowing and wall balls. But like you know, it's yeah. You have a great rowing advantage. Deadlifts yep. are probably not too bad for you. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Depending on how long your arms are. Yeah. I'm just assuming you have like knuckles on the ground. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 they're normal, but like you know, it's the one thing. The one thing I do have is like dead, deadlifting's a little like after a while, my lower back will start going because it's just like I have to pull it so high up compared to like other people, and so it's. You know, but it, it's whatever. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna stop because I'm not beating everybody. I love it, so I'm not gonna change. Right, that's the right approach. Yeah. So, what what's your style of like working out? Um. So it was bodybuilding for a while, not for any reason. I just, you know, I like breaking a sweat. Mm-hmm. I like, like, you know, lifting moderate weights for moderate reps. Um. But now it's really strongly shifting over to powerlifting. Um. I think it's a lot more interesting. Um. With bodybuilding, like. I don't think I really had any specific goals Mm -hmm. where it was like, I haven't ever really cared that like maybe when I first started working out, I cared about like, you know, sculpting my body. Um, but I haven't really cared too much about that for like years. Um, so at that point it was just like, okay, I'm doing three sets, 12 reps, whatever it is, 135. Um, but there was no way to like gauge my progress. Mm -hmm. It was too random. Um, so with powerlifting, I find it a lot easier to kind of, be objective about what I want to do. It's like, okay, you're either moving that weight or you're not moving that weight. Um, and a lot of the time I'm not moving it and that's okay. Um, it gives you something to strive for. So yeah. right now, definitely in a power lifting kind of phase. Very cool. Very cool. So you, you live in New York and so obviously COVID, you had like a lot of shutdowns and everything like that. So how do you, how did you stay, fit throughout that whole like you know lock- i mean i don't know if you guys are in lo- still in lockdown or whatnot no thank god we're we're done <laughs> we're starting to open indoor dining i don't want to jinx it people are getting the vaccine praise them like thank you mm-hmm. um during shutdown i was coaching orange theory classes virtually okay for a little bit and then when the gyms in miami opened up i migrated down to miami for the gym um probably one of the most like obsessive things I've ever done in my life, but it's fine. Um, so I was just in Miami for a couple of months and I coached at some orange theories down there and I was actually still in a bodybuilding kind of thing mm-hmm. towards the beginning of COVID or the end of COVID, I guess we're still in COVID. I just mean that like the quarantine part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. You went down to Miami. So like, that's like a whole change of scene because I, I, I live in Georgia. So like the gyms were opened up like pretty, probably I don't know, like six months after the pandemic happened. Oof. So yeah, you know, I think that's I think that was true for Miami also. New York was closed until like I want to say September, October. Yeah, so they like we were out. Yeah, well, I, th- I think yeah, I think it was like roughly around like August, maybe. I'm thinking, don't quote me on that, but it's like it was er- it was early and like. We have like this air filtration system that supposedly kills like ninety ninety nine percent of like the bacteria, like you know, air pollution. I, I don't know. No, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then like like it's like no man. Like I still go to the gym. There's like barely anybody wearing masks. Like you know, I don't I don't like wear. Like right now. Yes, like right now. Like I don't wear a mask either. It's just yeah. It's just like try to keep our distance and stuff. Okay, I'm not judgmental of that. Like if your gym doesn't care, then. Yeah, it, you. well, they, your life. yeah. So, so, when, you. so Georgia law is if they have a st- they have this big like poster on the door saying if you get COVID from being in here, it's not our fault for getting it. We don't have that here. No, we don't have that here. Here, we're like you need to sign in, and like if someone gets COVID, you're getting a call saying someone who was near you got COVID. Um, I had COVID like a month or two ago, and like they were pretty serious. They called me up 10 days after my positive test, which was like already past the isolation period. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, just let me know you had a positive test. So I'm like, I know I'm already out of isolation. <laughs> and they're like, Oh yeah, you are. And yeah. I hung up. So, but, um, so speaking of COVID, so how was your blood sugars throughout that whole time of you having COVID? Uh, for the first like few days, it wasn't so bad. And then I think as it progressed, like my blood sugar started to get a little bit more out of control. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was also like in my house, not moving at all. 
eating like a lot of junk food and, you know, trying to test out my sense of taste and smell. I'm like, huh, Sour Patch Kid, do I still taste these? What are these like? <laughs> Interesting texture. Um, so it was kind of like, I don't know if it was the disease itself or my behavior during it that affected my blood sugars. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Because I've had... I've had some other people I've talked to that had have has had COVID, and their like blood sugars were like through the roof. Obviously, like each person's different, but you know, I mean, I don't know if I've had COVID or not. I mean, knock on wood, hopefully not. But you know, you know, my, hopefully not. Yeah, my blood sugar's been fine. I've been trying to isolate the whole like you know, I was working from home for quite a while, and like barely going to the I wouldn't go to the gym because I'd have like a I have a gym in my basement, so I just you know work out there. So. Why do you ever go to the gym? Well, here's that's that's a good good question because I I I lift heavy weights and stuff like especially with CrossFit, and so like I don't want to wake the kids up because I I have a five year old and two year old, and so my two year old takes naps from like one to you know one to three or one to four, and so you know I can't really like drop the weights from overhead or or anything like that or try to make noise especially at night you too. You could, but you shouldn't. Yeah, exactly, and and like. <laughs> And especially at night too, like both my kids are sleeping, and if I just keep on like hitting hitting the ground and stuff like that, and it would wake them up because I'm in my basement, but they're on the opposite side of the house, but on the second floor, and there's not really like you could hear everything. Mm. So yeah, that's a good reason. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, and so when I'm like doing Olympic weightlifting or CrossFit, I'll just wake up and go to the gym, and then like just drop the weights there when I'm where I'm supposed to, and then just <laughs> then then and then come home, and then like you know my kid my son's just waking up and I'm ready for ready, you know, to get him ready for go to school. Wow. So that's what time do you go to sleep? Uh, like 10 o'clock. So I get like six hours of sleep. All right. That's not that bad. It's not, the, it's not the greatest, but like, you know, I, I've noticed if I sleep later, I just get, I'm even more groggy than I, than I am like during the weekday when I'm left and wait. Honestly, I could see that. Like sometimes I'll like get like 10 hours of sleep and I'll wake up and I'm like, that wasn't enough. Yeah, yeah. But if it's like six or seven, then I'm like, all right, I'm good. Yeah, that's fine. I don't, I don't remember the last time I've had ten hours of sleep. By the way. Well, you have children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's typically like my son wakes up at like six or whatever, and he's just like opening the door, and he's like, "Hey, Dad, are you awake?" I'm like, "Go back to bed. Just like, get away from me. Just go. Just go in your room and play. Just, just leave us alone." Does he listen? Oh yeah, he does. Or like that's he goes, nice or he goes downstairs and watches TV or something like that. So. Okay, that's good. Yeah, it's you know it happens, but um, so where are you still? You're not down in Miami, but like where are you training now for uh, you know, for powerlifting? Um, so I work at a gym called Elite Barbell. Okay. Um, and also Harbor Fitness, and then of course Orange Theory. Um, Elite and Harbor would be my two like powerlifting gyms. Even though Harbor isn't like specific for that, Elite is. If you're in Brooklyn, check it out. Um, so yeah, I'm training there. I'm. Honestly, like, I'm pretty new to the whole powerlifting thing. Like, mm-hmm. I'm following 531. I'm just going to keep going with that until, like, until it doesn't work anymore, yep. I guess. Um, and then I'm probably going to try to find, like, a coach or something to, like, push me further. Yeah. Have you ever tried the 20, 20 rep max back squat cycle? I hate it. I don't know if it's a cycle. I tried a 20 rep max squat once. Yeah. And I did it, like, at probably much lower than my 20 rep max and it was horrible <laughs> yeah so it's like a six week program where you you start at like you do what your one rep max and then that week you do it twice twice a week and you do 60 percent the first week and then you go up five percent and just keep on going up and up and up until you like can't go any further oh that sounds horrible <laughs> yeah it's it i i did it and it was god I, I had some come to jesus moments i was like i don't know if i could hold on to this bar anymore i was like miserable that like rep- almost did, it, did it like progress your squat oh yeah like significantly yeah yeah i mean i i like front squatting more than back squatting because of my knees so so that's it helped out my front squat so i'm I'm happy with that but uh yeah it was it was hard so hard like you're like you're at like rep rep eight and you're like oh i got this then rep 12 hits and you're like oh my god i got like oh i got so many more to left to go no, since I started this like powerlifting thing, anything past like five reps just seems like a lot to me. <laughs> yeah, which is terrible because like the last set on five through one is meant to be an AMRAP. I just like get to number five and I'm like, I don't want to go further than this. Yeah, yeah. Do like, you... I feel like this is good. Yeah. Do you still do cardio too while you're while you're doing powerlifting or? 
Yeah, Orange Theory. Yeah. I think everyone should do cardio. Okay. All right. And I know people have to be like, it's going to kill your gains. It, I'd rather have a healthy heart than like anything else. Yeah. Um, and the only thing that doing cardio could do is make my heart healthier and make me better at everything else I'm doing, yeah. including powerlifting. So I don't want to hear any of that bull bleep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, just, just look at like the top CrossFit athletes. They can do powerlifting. They, they, de- like, they deadlift like 600 pounds. They could back squat like 500 you know, and yeah, they could, they're as, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'm mean, trying not to like say curse. No, you could name. swear. I don't. I don't care. It's all good. So, um, so but anyways, so I, so you started the way I we I found out about you was you follow me on Instagram and I actually clicked on your bio and you had like, you have like twenty six thousand followers on Instagram. So, how did how did that come about? I have no idea, <laughs> honestly. Um, I used to be like. I still am very into like raving and mm-hmm. the rave scene. So when I was younger, I would like post like, you know, the parties I was going to or like the, the outfits I was wearing to them. And I think that explains my like 96% male demographic. Um, and it's like, I think that a couple of pages that are like rave pages reshared my pictures and it all just kind of came from there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I stopped posting that, so I guess that explains like my low engagement now. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, huh, we came to see you in like a thong at a party, not to see you at the gym, fully clothed, yeah, lifting more than us. Mm-hmm. So, what are you trying to gauge? Like, what, what's your goal for your Instagram page for like your fitness endeavor? Um, that's a really good question because like I'm not really looking to like. I think I'm just looking to help people and give good information on it. And for that reason, like I'm thinking more about like YouTube and I think it's easier to get like information across mm-hmm. in a video format. Um, for Instagram, I'm kind of like at a standstill. I'm, there are certain things I'm very passionate about, like vaccines and yep. like, um, lifting. Yeah. I, I think it's just those two things. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm just trying to build my brand around that and keep it more also body positive I feel like that gets lost a lot with us like stronger women I feel like sometimes we don't appeal to like general population people and I would really like to kind of tell that every day just anyone like it's okay to be strong it's okay to take up space it's okay to like work out and ask for a rack at the gym and not be intimidated because I know a lot of like my gym life I was very intimidated Mm -hmm. how did you snap out of that practice yeah (laughs) just that's like a big theme in my life you just need to keep on doing it and eventually you'll get good at it and eventually you'll realize like you know you just gotta go Mm -hmm. you just need to like if you have a goal you can't let gym intimidation stand in your way or really anything stand in your way you just need to like push through those obstacles yeah i mean when i was when i was personal training for a while like i'd have all my female clients they get super nervous to go into like the free weight area and I'm like, yeah. yeah, I'm like, we're we're going over there. And they're like, no, like, I don't want to go over there. Like, they're, people are intimidating. I'm like, I always tell them, like, they don't care about you. They just want to look at themselves and work on their own. That's it. Like, they don't worry. They don't worry about, all they do is worry about themselves. So. You know, I try to tell people that, but then I know, like, my own experience of, like, there are, like, specifically men who stare at other women, who stare at women in the gym. And there are other women who are judgmental of women in the gym and just like, you know what, people are probably going to be judgmental and you just need to, you know, walk in with your head held high and just, just be you. Just, yeah. You have a goal. It doesn't matter what they're thinking. It doesn't matter like what they're saying, just do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that also kind of changes their mindset towards other people in the gym too, specifically other women where it's like, okay, I'm happy for that girl. Like maybe she is new. Maybe she's just feeling her way out. Maybe she is doing an exercise. I think is like kind of strange or silly. But she's here, and that's what matters, and she's trying, and she's, you know, just taking up space and not being ashamed to do so. Yep. I yeah. think that's really important. Yeah. My, my thing is if, like, if you step foot in the gym, you're doing something right. So, yeah, I mean, just, just just get up and move. Just do your thing. You know, you know, if you want to learn from somebody else, you just, just ask, and they'll, they'll – a lot of people are more than welcome to help you out. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's my thing. Like, I, I have a – guy that I work out with, he's a, he's like an old Air Force guy like me. And uh, he's like, I need to start doing more cardio. So him and I, 
like do the do the CrossFit workouts that I I follow. But obviously he scales it because he's not like he can't do handstand push-ups. He can't do certain things, and so and he's just starting to do Olympic weightlifting. So I'm just like, how long does it take people to like get to the handstand push-up? Because oh. I feel like that's something that's hard. Yeah, it's. So my thing is like so I the way I learned learned it was just get up against the wall first. That's the first step. Like you get the one leg getting up and then the last leg you just swing it up just so you can get to the wall and then hold it. And so just get used to that and then once you get the hang of that you just start doing like 30 second holds on the wall. And so that actually builds you know more strength in your shoulder because obviously it's almost like a military press but you're holding more weight upside down so and on your shoulders so just do 30 second holes and then you can kind of slowly do like negatives to hit the ground like to hit the ground and like get your feet off the wall and then kick back up again and do that and then you just start working on handstand push-ups too make sure you have padding underneath your head yeah, too i was gonna so, say like <laughs> yeah like if i'm doing handstand push-ups in the gym that I'm, that I'm at like i usually have like four of those like like place mats like the yoga mats that they have at the for like the um group fitness training i usually have like four of them just so when i go down i just i don't whack my head you know pretty oh hard yeah and, and another thing is like if some people don't feel safe doing that you could always do you know like putting your feet on a box or a bench and kind of like almost do a pike and do it that way because obviously if you fall on your head you can like crack your neck or something like that so you know don't scare people away yeah i mean they just if, if you do the pike push-ups kind of i mean that will help and then you could do it on a box and then kind of work you work your way to the wall okay i'm so, gonna have to try those yeah it, it's fun feeling brave yeah i mean i've i think the most i've done at one time was i think it was like 12 handstand push-ups at one time it sounds so, like a lot to me yeah and it's it blew my shoulders up but i mean yeah it's i mean it's it's just like olympic weightlifting it takes time it takes time so. Have you gotten any injuries from CrossFit? Uh, that's like a pretty popular like rumor. No, I mean it's yeah, it's a pretty popular rumor. I I, I have if my thing is, I always tell people if your form's bad, you're gonna get hurt. So just work on form first, and when you get the form down, the weight will go up, and then like you know you'll be fine. But there's been times where I did a front squat, and I I was like trying to be, you know, adventurous and try to PR. And then I lifted it up like halfway up and I had to dump it and I pushed my butt back and I think my like my glute muscles like pulled. So my whole you lower your butt? Yeah, like I, I don't know what I was doing, but like my whole lower back was completely shot. So Ooh, how I, much weight was it? It was like two seventy five or something like that. And so oh and so like I was sleeping on the couch with pillows, my knees were like a ninety degree angle, just like because it was I, I had bad form and then I was doing a, a clean off a block after like a month after I was healed and I caught it and then I just jerked down a little bit and buckled my back and the same injury happened again so how did you fix it just you know just slow time, time you know just you know corrective exercises and stuff like that you know not lifting heavy and then just kind of progressed from there so like it was so bad. And now you're feeling good. Oh yeah, I'm I'm perfectly fine. So I mean, okay. yeah, I mean, you couple like, couple like knee injury, like like little knee injuries or something like that, or just like you know, for me being a dumbass, not warming up properly, you know, because I have a certain. I, I think that's a lot of us. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you get like a little aches and pains here and there, but I'm like, all in all, I'm, I'm pretty good. So. That's good. Yeah. That's so. good to hear. I think that at a certain level, like injuries are almost unavoidable. Yeah, I mean it's, I mean they, all these all people see is CrossFit like they get injured like oh I have a friend that like really got injured and just couldn't work out for a year, and it's like well what was their form like and what were they doing or did they have the did they have the right coach, or the right, right you know because obviously with CrossFit just like Orange Theory you have a large amount of people in one setting and I don't do you have another coach with you when you're, no okay so like it's like one person with like 20 to 25 people at one time. So it's like, it's really hard to watch everybody all at once. And that's true. so, I mean, that's when, in that's where injuries come from too. So, and then people just get adventurous and then, you know, put up way too much weight and then that's, that's how they get screwed. You know, I think it's really important for like people who take group fitness classes to understand that it's okay to ask the coach for like help mm -hmm. and um, form checks and stuff. Because I like, 
if anyone from Orange Theory is listening to this right now, please ask me for form checks. And like, if you're unsure of something, ask. Like, we like that. Um, I think that a lot of people like kind of shy away from that for some reason. Yeah. I mean, because they're nervous. Have you had that? Yeah, I've had that all the time. Like, people get nervous and they just think that, you know, it's a, it's a stupid. Qu- they think it's a stupid question, and so right. and, and they and they be embarrassed about it. I'm like, no, just ask, just ask me. I don't care. So I mean, right. I I want you to understand and know what, what we're doing, and get the form right. So like, cause if you do it on your own, I don't want you to get hurt. Absolutely. Um, so question about the Dexcom. Now that yes, go I'm for like it. Circling yeah, yeah. all the way back to the beginning. No, you're good. Um, you mostly put it where on like your stomach. So or it doesn't I, matter. So I I actually got this from Kelly Wilds. Um, she's been on my podcast twice. So she put it on her glute muscle, on like the top part of her glute muscle. And so I was like when I had the Dexcom, um, I was always worried about putting it on my side because I have a, I put a weight belt on and I didn't want it to right. like I didn't want it to rip. And so I just put it on my glute muscle and like it was out of sight, out of mind, really. And so I've had no issues with it. I just make sure like, you know, when I before I put it on, I, I place it like in the area I wanted to do it. And then I just kind of do a quick squat to see if it just doesn't like the sticker doesn't pull. Just make sure. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, it's it's worked perfect. Are you able to put it on your arm? Yeah, you can. Like, I don't even know. Yeah, uh, but, I kind of like this one that's so like little and like it's a little button. Yeah, I mean my my thing is like I'm always worried about like nicking something. See, I have that with my stomach. I don't know why. I feel like my stomach gets rubbed on things. Yeah, I mean there's a couple I, there's been a couple times I was I was like getting out of the car and I nicked my butt against like the side of the door, and I'm like ooh, and so I kind of like you know just put pressure on the sticker again and just make sure it stick sticks. But you know with the Libre when I had it. Um, I was reaching for my shoes or something like that. And I was in an office chair and like the armrest actually nicked my Libre and, and ripped it off. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. So, That's a Libre horror story. Yeah. Right and I'm sitting there like, Oh my God, no, no. And I was trying to put it back in and it was just, wasn't working. And I'm like, put it back in. yeah, I, I mean, I was an idiot. I didn't know. So, but, uh, yeah. And it did, it just didn't work. And I was like, whatever. I mean, it happens, but the, like I got, I always, I realize now that there's a 15 minute delay in the Libre and the Dexcom. So like yeah. what I would do is like I would scan it, take insulin and then like 10 minutes later or five minutes later, scan it again because I always get freaked out and I'm like, Oh crap. You know, I need to take more insulin. I just It'd take, be high, take again. Yeah. 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 And, and it's just like, then I would absolutely tank. And so I'm like realizing now I'm like, Hey, it's, it's a 15 minute delay. Just calm down. It's, you know, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, I always find it kind of interesting that, like, I could test with the Libre and then do a finger stick, and, like, whatever the finger stick is, the Libre will be in about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, like, why, why do my fingers see the future? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, so the, the thing is, is, like, I've had times where I would check the Libre and then check my finger, and there's, like, a 120-point difference. That's insane. So, I haven't had that yet. Yeah, so that's, that's why I was kind of, like, hesitant on getting back on the Libre. I mean... On, like, the flip side of that, there is, like, a 10-minute discrepancy. Mm-hmm. Like, your finger stick will be accurate 10 minutes from now on the Libre, but 120 points sounds crazy. Yeah. Like, I've even asked people, like, other diabetics on social media. I'm like, is this normal? And they're like, no. And I was like, okay, no. okay all right. Well, I guess I won't re- really rely on this now. I just maybe need to calibrate my Libre or something like that. So, I have had times where, like, I checked with the Libre, and it felt like, it maybe felt like lower than it was showing and I would do like a finger stick test and it would match the Libre, but I'd do like a few more finger stick tests and they'd be all over the place. Yeah. And that was like confusing to me. I'm like, has my glucometer just been off this whole time? And it's really, I guess what your body gets calibrated to do, you know, at the end of the day, kind of, these are arbitrary numbers and we just kind of like a scale, you know, as long as you're using the same one, it's accurate enough. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear you. So I have another question for you. So you're sponsored by Evolve. Is it Evolve Fitness? Oh, you froze. Evolution. Evolution. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, you're breaking up. But uh, yeah, Evolution. Okay, so how, are we back in action? I, yes. So how how did that get involved? Wait a second. Yep. I'll connect it to my iPhone. One second. Let me try to do this because I think that it might be a little bit better. Oh, no. 
okay, you, you, you're good. You're good. good. You're good. You're good. I so like, we're gonna have to do it all over. No, you're good. So um, so Evolve Fitness. So how did that come about? Um, so I actually started using their pre workout a few years ago, um, and I really liked it. And I'm like, okay, like this is this is good. I wasn't crashing after it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I reached out to them and I'm like, hey, do you guys want to collaborate? Because I like what you do. Like I like your products. And they said yeah. And then a few months later, we just started working together. Um, it's obviously not like a big source of income for me or anything. It's just I found something I like mm -hmm. and I would like to share it with people. Um, I'm a huge fan of their pre-workout and also their protein powder. If anyone's wondering what I take from them, it's pretty much that and like a few other things like multivitamins and, you know, whatever fun supplements they have. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Yeah, because uh, I'm a like, you know, I'm sponsored, I'm not sponsored, but like, you know, I'm an affiliate marketer with this company called Liberté Lifestyle and they do like knee sleeves, shirts, like shorts and all that stuff. And so I mainly, cool. I mainly just use them for the, the knee sleeves cause I have a shirt company. So, but yeah, like I've, you know, I, I only pimp products that I actually like. So just like yourself. Yeah, no, me too. Um, I would never tell people to buy something I didn't like use myself. I actually have their multivitamin like sitting on the table over there. <laughs> it's too far away for me to get, but it, it is there, I promise. Yeah, no, I believe you. I believe um, you. I have their thing on my water bottle. Nice. Very cool. But yeah, I like th I like them. They're not just like paying me off to say I like them. I, I reached out to them to work with them. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So we're getting close to the end. So um, I have like four questions to ask you. So do you have a favorite book that you like to read or like would, would give to somebody as a gift? Um, let me on. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a book called, okay, I'll start with the one I like the most or I like the most as I, when I was younger. It's called Freakonomics. Okay. And I read it like in high school and I just thought it was like a really interesting book. Um, it has nothing to do with fitness or diabetes. I just really like the book, and I think that it's interesting, and it, it's just an interesting way of looking at things. Highly recommend that. And then there's a different book called Rejection Proof. Okay. It's um, it also has nothing to do with diabetes or anything, but it's I think it's very useful for people who are like, I guess, intimidated or afraid to ask questions because they're afraid of getting told no. Mm -hmm. Um, it's about this guy who just he goes in this little adventure of asking people for ridiculous things that he knows they're going to say no to and um he just kind of explores how he feels about it and how he reacts to it and how he could change their nose into like either yeses or an answer that's more favorable to him than a no interesting um so i think that's a really interesting book very cool any, any other really good one um, I read a book recently about a woman with schizophrenia. I forgot the name of the book, but it was a very interesting book, and it like it was her true story. Mm -hmm. If I found the name of it, I'll text it to you. All good, all good. Not, it's not on my bookshelf. It's all good. Um, so, so the next question is: so, do you have? I obviously with school, like this, like we'll not talk about school, but um, do you have any goals that you want to hit by next year? Um, I want fitness or in life. We'll do fitness. We can do fitness in life. All right, so fitness-wise, I want to be deadlifting more than 405, benching hopefully 220 plus, squatting 305 plus, or 315 plus really, um, overhead pressing 135 plus. Okay. And maybe doing more than like five pull-ups in a row because I've been <laughs> kind of stagnated there. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, five or six handstand push-ups. We'll throw that in. Okay. We'll throw that in. Very cool. Um, Though I guess one would be good also. And then in life, I'm just, I'm hoping whatever schools I apply to get me, let me in. Okay. That's really my goal right now. Yeah, very cool. And then, um, so where can people reach out to you if they have like any questions about like fitness, diabetes, or anything like that? Um, they could always message me on Instagram and whenever I log on to it, I'll get back to them. And my Instagram is Liz Tess, which you definitely know. Mm-hmm. Um, they can also email me, alise at liztest.com or management at liztest.com. And that is linked on my Instagram profile. I'm more likely to be responsive there because I check my email more frequently than I check my Instagram. But if someone like mentions diabetes or like fitness, then I'll, I'll respond. All right. Very cool. Well, I just want to thank you very much for coming on my podcast, you know, and thank you for, you know, let me take some time away from, you know, what you're doing up in New York and, you know, talking to you about your story. 
My pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me to be on this. Very cool experience. Um, 10 out of 10 would recommend. <laughs> and I know this is your first... Jesse Theodore, if you're watching. Yeah, so this is your first podcast ever you've done. So. Yeah. yeah, that's accurate. Yeah, how did you think it went? I had a good time. Okay. How was it for you? Oh, it's always good. I, I always like talking to fellow diabetics, so... I mean, I see you started a whole brand off of it. Yes, I did. I did, and I'm I'm very grateful because I've... If it wasn't for, you know, the diabetes community, I probably wouldn't have, I'd be still like, you know, not knowing anything. So, I mean, there's, there's a couple stories after this, I'll tell you, like, from just talking to other diabetics, because like, my endocrinologist wouldn't tell me anything. I would love to hear more about so, that. So, all right. Well, well, thank you very much for doing this, and we'll, uh, we'll talk later, okay? All right. My pleasure. Thanks so much.